So we're diving into GPT-4, this whole new language model thing. Mm -hmm. And you guys have sent in a ton of research on it. Papers, technical docs, the works. It's a lot to unpack. It really is. But it seems like you're ready to go deeper than just the height. You want to know what GPT-4 can actually DO. Exactly. And honestly, looking at all this, there are a lot of numbers, tables, jargon. Yeah, it can make your head spin a bit. For sure. But that's what we're here for. That's right, to break it down. Exactly. And just from skimming, it sounds like GPT-4 can do it all. It's pretty impressive. Solving these crazy coding problems, writing different kinds of creative stuff. Like, I even saw poems mentioned, music notation. Mm -hmm. There's even something in here about it generating sketches. Wild, right? Definitely ahead of the curve. But before we get too carried away, let's bring in our expert to help us make sense of it all. Happy to be here. Always good to have you. So from these documents, it's clear GPT-4 is a big step forward in language model tech. Would you say that's fair? It absolutely is a significant advancement, but, and this is key, it's super important to understand not just what it can do, but also its limitations. Totally. Like it's like anything new, right? Shiny new gadget, it's exciting, but gotta know its limits. Precisely. One of the biggest differences with GPT-4 right off the bat is its sheer size. We're talking trained on a massive amount of data. Okay, so bigger is better in this case. You could say that it basically supercharges its abilities. Imagine like our brains have a limited amount of space we can use at once, right? Right. GPT-4 size combined with this thing called uh, paged optimizers. Okay, already sounds complicated. Don't worry too much about the specifics. Basically, it helps GPT-4 manage that huge GE brain power by bringing the most relevant info to the front when it needs it. So like a super organized mental filing cabinet. Exactly. That's wild. And this leads to some really impressive results, right? I'm seeing GPT-4 just crushing these benchmark tests, doing better than other language models, and even, wait for it, surpassing human level performance in certain areas. It's true, and it's a big deal. Like, how is that even possible? It's a machine. One of the papers talks about GPT-4's scores on this human evil benchmark. It's a test, basically, that looks at how well a model can solve coding challenges. And get this, GPT-4 scored a 67%. Okay, 67%, that's good. It's amazing. That's higher than any language model before it. Andy, it even beats some human programmers. Whoa, no way, seriously. Seriously. Okay, that's a game changer. But there's got to be a catch, right? Nothing's perfect. You're right. One of the things the researchers point out is this issue of hallucinations. Hallucinations, like yeah. it's seeing things. Is GPT-4 haunted or something? Not quite. In language model terms, hallucinations mean GPT-4 makes stuff up. It might present info that sounds right, but it's actually wrong, maybe even completely made up. Okay, so it can be convincing, but not always accurate. Got it. Imagine it like writes code based on outdated info. It might look good, but it won't work how it's supposed to. That's a problem. Exactly. Well, That's the hallucination challenge. Okay, so not perfect. Good to know. But let's go back to how it learns for a second, because I'm seeing terms like chain of thought prompting and RLHF fine tuning. And I got to be honest, those sound like something out of a sci-fi movie to me. Oh. They do sound complicated, yeah. Can you break those down? What do they even mean? Of course. Think of chain of thought prompting like this. You're trying to solve a really tricky riddle, right? Okay. And it's like you get a little nudge in the right direction, then another one. And they kind of lead you step by step to the solution. That's kind of what chain of thought prompting does for GPT-4. Breaks down these complex problems into smaller manageable steps. So it's like giving GPT-4 a trail of breadcrumbs to follow. Exactly. You got it. Okay. I like that. Makes it seem less intimidating. What about this RLHF fine tuning? So RLHF fine-tuning stands for Reinforcement Learning from Human Feedback. Basically, it's training the model with positive reinforcement. Like, think about training your dog. With treats. Exactly. Treats, praise, all that good stuff. So the model gets rewarded when it generates outputs that are in line with what humans prefer. It learns what kind of responses are most helpful, most appropriate. So it's like teaching GPT-4 to be the good boy of language models. You could say that. I like it. Okay, so we're getting a handle on the lingo. Now let's see this tech in action. Because these papers mention GPT-4 doing some seriously incredible stuff. Like take coding, for example. Yeah. GPT-4 doesn't just solve these coding puzzles. It can actually generate working code from, like, just descriptions. Whoa, for real? Yeah. Imagine you're trying to build a website, but you have zero coding knowledge. Right. 
You literally tell GPT-4 what you want and bam, it builds the basic framework for you. Okay, that's kind of blowing my mind right now. It's a big deal. That's the kind of potential we're talking about here. So it's like having a personal web developer on call 24-7. Essentially, yeah. Goodbye, coding boot camps. Hello, GPT-4. But wait, didn't we just talk about these hallucinations? You did, yes. So couldn't GPT-4 create code that, like, looks good but actually has flaws because it's pulling from outdated info or something? That is a super important point. You're absolutely right to be cautious. Okay, good. GPT-4 is powerful, no doubt. But it's not magic, right? It's still being developed. Yeah. And those hallucinations can definitely trip it up, especially in something like coding where accuracy is everything. Right, right, of course. So always double check its work, especially for something that complex. Always a good idea. What other like crazy capabilities did these papers mention? What else can GPT-4 do? Well, get this. It can actually tackle complex math problems that even humans would struggle with. No way. Seriously. Yeah, like... We're not just talking like basic arithmetic here. No, no, no. We're talking about equations that would take your head spin. Okay, so hold on. Are we saying GPT-4 could actually help scientists, like, solve complex equations, lead to new discoveries? Potentially, yeah. That's the thing with this tech. The possibilities are huge. That's kind of what's freaking me out a little, not going to lie. It's exciting, though, right? It is, because we're not just talking about automating tasks here. It's about pushing the boundaries of what's possible. Exactly. This is incredible. Okay, what else? There's more. It also shows a lot of promise when it comes to creative writing. Okay, now that is interesting. The research mentions GPT-4 generating poems, even code for creating visual art. And get ready for this. Music notation. Hold on. It can write music. It can. Okay, how does that even work? Essentially, you give GPT-4 prompts, maybe descriptions of the kind of music you're looking for, and they can actually generate Musical notation, you know, like ABC notation. So you're telling me one day I could be listening to a symphony composed by GPT-4? It's possible. This is getting a little too sci-fi for me. It's definitely pushing boundaries. But it's important to remember, even with this creative stuff, GPT-4 is still working within the bounds of the data it was trained on. Right, right. So it can create variations on musical styles that already exist. But it's not like composing truly original pieces in the way a human composer might. At least not yet. Okay, good to know. Reality check. It's easy to get carried away with the possibilities, but it's good to remember this tech is still in its early stages. We've talked about coding, math, music. Is there anything GPT-4 can't do? Well, one of the most exciting things about GPT-4 is actually its potential as a, and this is cool, a tool user. A tool user. What does that even mean when we're talking about a language model? So the research suggests that GPT-4 can actually interact with external systems. Okay. Things like search engines, calculators, even software for debugging code. So wait, it can actually talk to other programs. Like, it can use Google. Essentially, yeah. That's wild. Imagine GPT-4 not just writing code, but actually running it testing it, even refining it, using these debugging tools. That is wild. That could completely revolutionize how we develop software. So, so it's not just a passive generator of text. It's an active problem solver that can actually tap into other resources to get things done. Exactly. That is incredible. There was this one example in one of the papers, I can't remember which one, but they used GPT-4 to figure out how to crack the password on this like simple program. I think I remember that. It was like watching a digital detective at work. It was so cool. That's a great way to put it. And that, I think, is where GPT-4's true potential lies. Mm. Not necessarily in replacing humans completely, but in augmenting our capabilities. Right, right, yeah. Instead of worrying about GPT-4 taking over the world, we should be thinking about how it can make us better at what we do. 100%. Like having a super-powered assistant who can handle the tedious stuff so we can focus on the bigger picture. Exactly. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so we've covered a lot of ground here. GPT-4's impressive capabilities, its limitations, like those hallucinations, this whole game-changing tool-using ability. So, like, where do we even land on this? Should we be excited? scared, just totally confused. I'd say a healthy mix of all three is probably the right reaction. Right. It's definitely exciting, but yeah, it's a little daunting too, right? Thinking about how big of an impact this could have. Totally. And not just the good impact, the bad stuff too, you know? Absolutely. GBT4 is a powerful tool, no doubt. That's the thing. And like any tool, it can be used for good or, well, not so good things. Exactly. It's kind of like that old saying, right? With great power. Comes great responsibility. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that definitely applies here. It really does. Like, it's on U.S. to make sure we're using this technology the right way. You yeah, know? responsibly, 100%. And that starts with really understanding its limitations. We've talked about the whole hallucination thing. Right, making stuff up. But there are other challenges, too, like GPT-4, because it's trained on this massive data set, right? Right, like all that info. Sometimes it can reflect the biases that are present in that data. It's not perfect. Oh, interesting. So it's like if you learn to cook from a cookbook, but that cookbook only had recipes from like one part of the world. Exactly. You'd end up with a pretty limited view of what food is, right? Exactly. That's a great way to put it. So we have to be aware of those limitations and use GPD-4, you know, with a critical eye. Right. Especially for important stuff. Especially for stuff where those biases could have real consequences. Absolutely. You've given us a lot to think about. This yeah. has been, wow, really eye-opening. Glad to hear it. This whole deep dive on GPT-4, I feel like I need to go back and reread those papers now, knowing what I know. It's amazing how much more you pick up the second time around, right, once you have the context. Totally. Okay, so one thing that really stuck with me, though, was this idea of GPT-4 potentially designing its own tools. Like, what? It's a wild thought, right? That's insane. GPT-4 building its own toolbox, it's exciting, but also kind of terrifying. Like, are we in a sci-fi movie right now? Mm -hmm. I'm not even sure I'm qualified to be talking about this stuff, honestly. It's definitely pushing the boundaries of what we thought was possible. For sure. So it's not even just about what GPT-4 can do now. It's what it might be able to do down the road. Right. That's the big question, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's what's kind of freaking me out a little. It's exciting, don't get me wrong. But it really... like, wow. Yeah. Just wow. It's definitely a lot to process. Yeah. But that's how it always is with groundbreaking technology, isn't it? Challenges us to think differently. You always know how to bring it back around and make me feel better. Seriously, though, this has been amazing. Thanks for taking the time to break this all down with us. Happy to be here. Always a good conversation. And to everyone listening, thanks for joining us on this crazy journey into the world of GPT-4. It's a wild ride, that's for sure. And who knows what the future holds, right? The future is unwritten. I like that. We'll catch you all next time.